Did someone strap Litecoin and Ethereum to a rocket heading for the moon? It sure seems that way as the prices have shot up. Well, we're knee deep in bad crypto mess and we're finally prepared or semi prepared to discuss net neutrality, a subject matter where no one seems to be behaving like it's Switzerland. We've got listener comments, questions, and a whole lot of badness. It's us, your favorite, not financial advisors. And we're here to not advise you once again on episode number 62 of the Bad Crypto Podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, two, ignition. Who's bad? And greetings, citizens of the RBC. Welcome to the Bad Crypto Podcast, the show for the crypto curious, And the crypto serious. Remember, once you go bad, you never go back. We're heard in, what is it, 180 countries now, Travis? 180 countries, Mr. Joe Com. We need to figure out which ones we're not yet heard on so that we can have our listeners invite a friend that they might have in one of those countries so that we can, like Pokemon, catch them all. Yeah, we're not too far away. It's more fun when somebody, you know, asks a friend, like, who's got a friend in Zimbabwe? Although I'm sure Zimbabwe is probably on our map because they're crazy about Bitcoin there. Uh, as, the as this guy said, I am Joel Com, and I am one half of the crypto clowns here. And that's Travis Wright, who is celebrating uh, that we've now had over one million downloads of our shows. One million downloads. It's a big number. It's just, it's, you know, a million of anything. In five months, bro, less than five months. We did it in 21 weeks. That's like less than half a year. It's less than five months. That's crazy to me. I was, whenever we were doing, whenever we were sort of checking it out in like October and how we were trending and I was like, you know what? It looks like maybe by our six month anniversary, we'll be close to a million downloads. And then all of a sudden the crypto started snagging the masses a little bit more. And what we've noticed now is that my, 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 it has been unbelievable. The amount of growth that we've had, it, 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 it sort of resembles the Bitcoin chart itself, doesn't it, Mr. Joel Com? Crypto, the mass snagger. Uh, what we really, what blows me away is this metric that out of all podcasts in the world on iTunes, well, at least in the United States, we went as high as number 134. And I know where it's like, look at what we did. But honestly, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you guys. Your support of this program is just truly amazing and mind boggling to us. So thanks for following. Please make sure you subscribe. And if you haven't written your review yet, stop what you're doing. Hit hit pause because your reviews are what drive the awareness of the show on the platforms. Did you know that? It's not just the listens. They're watching to see how people review the different podcasts. So if you're on Stitcher or if you're listening on iTunes or if they allow you to review wherever else you might listen, take a moment, please, and go review us on the platform of your choice. We would appreciate that. Yep. Yep. It's, it's, it's really, it's really is mind boggling to think that out of the top 200 podcasts in the world right now, we're number 159 as of the recording this very minute, we were number one. who's counting? That is crazy to me. Uh, I, I'm just very grateful that uh, this show is resonating with you guys, the, the fine citizens of the Republic of Bad Cryptopia. Uh, thank you for tuning in. This has been a crazy journey so far. And you know what else we need to say thank you for? On behalf of Ronnie Moas, who you guys have really just overwhelmingly with your feedback and with your actions said that it was your favorite episode. Uh, The numbers for that episode are through the roof. And you guys gave something like $10,000 so far to foodforthepoor.org. And Ronnie, he's blown away. He's like, this wouldn't have happened without uh, you guys. And so he made a tweet that we're going to link to. The tweet was from a couple days ago. And it's at that point, it was about $7,000. It's about 10 now. But at that point, he said that that's 28000 
28,000 pounds of rice and beans that basically keeps 140 starving children alive for an entire year. You guys did that. You did it. Thank you. Uh, you know, give yourself a round of applause wherever you are. Like if you're in your office right now, just, just do that. If you're sitting on the toilet, you know, yeah. people will be like, Wow, that must have been a good but, one. <laughs> but but wait, there's more because he actually sent me a message on Facebook yesterday oh. and yeah, said what that? that what has happened now is that we had received over 100 different do donations for over $10,000, which now is feeding over 200 kids for a year. Oh my gosh, you guys, you are the best. Mr. Travis Wright, we have the best community don't we we do we do and i did I, you know absolutely we do i i love you guys and i did mention the ceo's name of food for the poor his name is robin my food <laughs> <laughs> I, and i asked him about that i said it's kind of a funny name for somebody in charge of giving food to the poor isn't it robin my food <laughs> That's R O B I N M A H F O O D. And he goes, Wow, I had never noticed that. Just like you never oh really noticed gosh. the arrow in the FedEx logo. <laughs> right. It's the, the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, yeah. right? Robbing my food. <laughs> Don't be robbing it. Well, here's another way that you guys can show uh, your support for the podcast is by popular demand, we have released the first edition of a bad crypto podcast t-shirt it's a limited edition the sale is only for nine days it's got the bad crypto podcast logo on the front and a bad coin on the back of uh, the neckline and uh once the sale's over this shirt will be um retired we will never use the same exact design again so you're going to want to get a shirt and hodl a shirt there are four different styles your regular standard t-shirt a uh, long sleeve t-shirt if you need to get you know warm for the winter wherever you are a tank top if it's already going to be warm for the winter where you are and we do not ignore the crypto chicks we have a women's v-neck and there's multiple colors on each shirt go to badco.in forward slash shirt to uh, and don't wait go get because when this is over that's it this campaign gets shut down and this first you will not be able to find one of these shirts again unless somebody sells you one for a bitcoin that's right we're only making 21 million of them ever <laughs> Oh, but they can get a free one. Well, they can't now because they will have missed it by the time the show comes out. But, you know, we're in the midst of bad crypto mess and I hope you guys enjoyed our horrible song. We had so much fun with that. And we are giving away prizes for uh, for 12 days. And the first one is happening today in the Facebook Mastermind. And we're giving away a T-shirt. You know, if, if you guys listen to this, as soon as the episode comes out, you might still be able to play. But there is a post in the Mastermind. And it's got a, an ornament with a one on it. And basically, in order to win the T-shirt, you have to um, make an animated GIF post or GIF. I, I never decide which one I liked. That says this is who Travis Wright is with just an animated Jeff. And so you can find that and participate. And some of you guys are jerks. I just want to say uh, <laughs> some of you guys obviously did not play to win. <laughs> <laughs> well, otherwise, watch for more. Uh, you know, each day we're going to be giving away something. And where are we doing that, though? Here's the thing that we're only doing it in a few places, only in the mastermind group, only in the telegram group. And where's the third place? Uh, our email. Our email. So People. the links are in the show notes to sign up for all of those if you want to, because we're giving away. I mean, there'll be uh, a little piece, some Satoshis in there. There's going to be some uh, Litecoin in there. There's going to be a Trezor in there. So you're going to want to uh, check that out. And also shout outs for our show sponsor of the month here, of course, the Zilla app. So the ICO marketplace app, look through ICOs, upvote, downvote, figure out which ones you like. And depending upon where you live, you will be able to participate in them with tokens and credit cards and the tip of your finger tap in your in. And the beta app should be available now or soon. I haven't heard from uh, from the team yet to let us know schedule, but uh, they're telling us they're working on wallet functionality and they want to kind of get your feedback on how the app feels so check it out zla.io forward slash bad we got a lot to talk about so let's get to it bad crypto voicemail you have one new message hey travis and joel this is tyler 
I'm a 21 year old college student from Columbia, South Carolina. Been listening to your podcast recently. I really enjoy it. Um, one of my favorite things though is that the amount of content that you guys put out seems like, uh, there's a new episode almost every day or even multiple times a day. And I really appreciate that. So definitely keep it up and I'll be listening. Ah, thank you, Tyler. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, we put out so much content because Joel makes us. He's, he has. <laughs> He is very, very difficult to work with. You guys, <laughs> he's not. <laughs> he's I like, let's do another video. Well, come on, let's do another one. Well, come on, we gotta record another <laughs> show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a cruel taskmaster. <laughs> no, you cannot have your gruel yet, Travis. Record some more. Be funny. Come on, be funnier. This is not funny enough. Whoops. <laughs> We love it. It, it. It's great fun. And we love getting calls and messages. Of course, that's the Bad Crypto Hotline, which you can call in at 708-885-9030. I always love when somebody posts in the group or in the Telegram, does anybody have the number to call in? It's like we only say it every show, almost as much as we are not financial advisors. Uh, so we got uh, another way we're contacted is via the contact form. And Mike wrote us to say, if miners are rewarded with Bitcoin for hashing slash confirming transactions, then what happens when all 21 million Bitcoin are mined? Won't the Bitcoin mining community leave and go somewhere else where they can mine another coin, therefore leaving Bitcoin's blockchain basically idle? Uh, so we, we have talked about this in the past. Travis, what's your take on it? I'm taking my mine and I'm going home, you guys. <laughs> It's mine. Oh, I'm done with you guys. I'm going to go over here. So I don't know. I don't know that mine. any of us are going to have to worry about that for one, because that's going to be in the year 2140, uh, unless they create some really amazing DNA resequencing to alter our age, you know, our, our aging process. That's already happened, Travis. Uh, I'm actually 200 years yeah, old. That's impressive. Thanks for sharing the uh, the serum of youth with me, brother. Um, so what, what's going to actually happen is there will be those transaction fees. So what happens in those moments is they're not going to get the reward for the mining. We're not going to get that little popped out, a little Bitcoin popping out. But what they will get is they will still receive uh, the transaction fees. So those are built in as well. So those will not go away. And I would assume as Bitcoin gets higher and higher than those, uh, those transaction fees, Fees might get a little bit higher too, but hopefully they can rein those in a little bit. Bill writes us. He says, guys, I'm a kid going to college at University of Chicago. The econ department just received $125 million for a donation. Uh, Want to help me convince them to put some of that money into magical internet money. money. Hello, ah. University of Chicago. Put some of that money into crypto. Uh, he says, stay bad. I listen to you guys whenever I'm walking to class, doing laundry, on the bus, dot, dot, dot. Thanks. Now, he didn't say you taking a crap. You know, that's I want to I want to hear from somebody who listens to us while doing their business. <laughs> Why? Hey, guys, love the show. Uh, this is Tom from Missouri. I was curious if you could explain what exactly a smart contract is. Hey, yeah, yeah. Hey, Tom from Missouri. What part of Missouri? I am also in the bathroom from Missouri. He, he, He's in the bathroom in Missouri. He's in the bathroom. All right. So, what is a smart contract? So, a smart contract is basically something you can build on top of the blockchain that becomes a repetitive process and something that basically you you define the rules of, and whenever it happens, it automatically triggers that. So, one of my favorite examples is when we were talking to Muse Economy, and let's say that Tom, Joel, and I are in a band and. Joel wrote the song, and then uh, you play the drums, Tom, and I play guitar. Every time somebody listens to the song, it costs them a penny. But since Joel wrote the song, he's actually getting like, you know, 50%. And then you and I are only getting 25% every time we get a listen because he wrote the song and he's singing the song. And so basically that that smart contract triggers that. And every time that that happens, boom, that money gets divided. And so basically they're just rules uh, and uh, that, that can get built on top of the blockchain to activate whenever these certain rules are triggered, right? How else would you add? What else would you add to that? I write the songs, give me some crypto things. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were just waiting to drop that, weren't you? You were just hold on, like, I can't wait till Travis shuts up, and then I'm going to sing this song and not answer what Travis said. 
I'm sorry. What was the question? I was going to say, what would you add to that? Actually, you were just sitting there pining. Uh, no, you, you, you explained it. I like the example. I think it's perfect. That's what smart contracts are. It's just, you know, um, Bitcoin is is simply a currency, right? Sending back and forth with smart, smart contracts lets us do if-then statements on top of the blockchain that, uh, that are conditional. And uh, that's what they are. So much news, Mr. Travis Wright, and the first story here, uh, uh, our friend, and by friend, I mean arch enemy, uh, actually, we, we don't know him at all, uh, Jamie Dimon, with the CEO of JP Morgan, caused uh, a furor earlier this year by being very vocal about his opposition to Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin's a fraud, he said, and then it was shown that, you know, JP Morgan was a fraud. <laughs> and they're like, oh, this is a scam. And then it was shown that JP Morgan is a scam. And so that's nice, Jamie, Jamie Dimon. That's so funny that you are basically saying that Bitcoin is essentially worthless out of one side of the mouth. And then out of the other side of the mouth, they're actively trying to create patents to replicate Bitcoin. It's it's weird that they're doing that. But now they've they've switched it around and said, hey, hey, you know, Bitcoin's maybe the new gold, you guys. It's it, you know, it has potential to elevate these cryptocurrencies to an emerging asset class. I mean, this is possible. You know, gold has a six trillion dollar valuation. As of this show, Bitcoin's market cap is two hundred and seventy seven billion which is, uh, you know, still a long way away, which is why the Winklevoss twins say that they could see Bitcoin still going up 20 times what it is right now. And they're holding a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. Not that they need it. They were millionaires before, but they're hodling it. And um, yeah, so Jamie, maybe it's time to just, you know, shut the front door and, and not say anything else is what I'm thinking. In other news... The SEC says they are not done with the ICOs, and uh, they're likely going to take some more actions against them. And uh, they basically said this, your responsibilities on knowing your customer are the same as if someone shows up and plunks a big bag of cash on your desk. So you need to know your customers. And uh, he spoke at the uh, the head of the SEC, Chairman uh, Jay Clayton. He said that there is very little distinction between handing people a piece of paper that says stock and asking people to put money in Bitcoin and ICOs, uh, according to this uh, Wall Street Journal report. So they are doing additional due diligence on this. And if you recall, I believe back in October, uh, Jeff Sessions, the the attorney general, he said that Bitcoin and the dark deep web is a bad thing and they're going to they're going to look into it. So you, know, you can tell that the government's still looking into to Bitcoin and uh, Clayton's comments actually happened just a few days before the first Bitcoin future contracts began trading on a regulated U.S. exchange. So lots of stuff is going on. So we'll we'll keep an eye on this as it develops. Yeah. And I just dropped a link into the show notes for you guys from the official SEC.gov uh, site. It's the official state. Well, it's a statement on cryptocurrencies and initial coin offerings. The whole thing is here for you to uh, to check out and read. And some people have considered it pretty favorable as, you know, trying to determine what's a token and what what isn't. And so it's an interesting read. We're not going to go in depth on it right now, but uh, I do recommend it uh, as recommended reading. So go ahead and check that out. Uh, got some news from the CoinDesk. They have released their third quarter Bitcoin and blockchain industry report. It's a pretty lengthy report, and we're just going to leave a link there because you we've kind of been telling you about what's been going on. And this summarizes a lot of it, um, you know, about the forks and about ICOs. But it's a, it's a really interesting read. And check out the show notes to uh, to see more about that. Yeah, so there's a couple pieces of interesting news from Coinbase this week. So according to the CEO, Brian Armstrong, there will be many more altcoins to be added to Coinbase in 2018. And uh, Armstrong said Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are stock market 2.0. And there's a great video of uh, the CEO there on uh, CNBC talking about cryptocurrencies. I don't believe they said which cryptocurrencies that they're going to be adding to Coinbase. They just said some altcoins and alternative cryptocurrencies will be added to Coinbase moving forward. 
Uh, but some of the, the speculations are Bitcoin Cash. You mentioned that's probably the one that you think it is because we know that they had that fork and they're already talking about Bitcoin Cash. Bcash. 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 Yeah, yeah. My bad. My bad. Sorry. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, Ripple probably won. Uh, Dash, Monero, IOTA are some of the other ones that are being tossed around as well. But we don't know how many. We don't know when. We, it just said in 2018 that that could happen. And there's also some additional news from coinbase as well you want to hit that mr joe com yeah well and i just want to say of course they're going to go for the coins that have the big market cap right so those are all top 10 11 coins and so uh, they're going to go where the the money is where are they doing bad coin too are they gonna have bad coin on there to buy for zero maybe in an alternate universe <laughs> where bad coin is the most popular cryptocurrency instead of the least popular cryptocurrency yeah. but you know dogecoin is one of the most loved cryptocurrencies so it's actually my personal goal for bad coin just to become loved that's all bad coin just want to be loved <laughs> bad coin just want to be loved by you there's a song there somewhere uh, basically coinbase you know they're they're putting in over a hundred thousand new customers every day so you know as far as the western world goes i think it's the most popular of the exchanges and certainly Our the most day? user -friendly. all day or day or day um they sent out an email to the entire user base basically to say please invest responsibly they're like you know be careful with your monies this is uh, this is not las vegas although it is speculation and you just you got to be careful about what you're doing and, and never invest uh, what you can't afford to lose. And by lose, I mean lose it all, right? There's always this chance that, you know, at least in my mind, there's always a chance that this whole thing could go away. Blockchain's not going away, right? But in terms of these sky high prices, it, it can all go away. There's so many different things that could happen. And I guess I'm, I'm wanting to create, not create, I'm wanting to acknowledge some healthy fear that is within myself about this. You know, I, I'm going to hodl and I'm looking at it kind of the way, you know, Ronnie Moes talked about that. This is what I've got in there. I can afford to lose. And if it goes away, my life will go on. But you never want to be in a position. It, I, I'll just I'll speak for myself. I never want to be in a position where um, losing my crypto will dramatically impact my life because it's only money. Yeah, that's true. It I would, I can't lie. I would be sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd be sad, but you would move on. It's not like, it's not like you fall into a hole and go. I'm I would screech. That. I would screech, screech helplessly to the sky, Mister Joel Com. <laughs> well, there are some people that, in the case of a downturn, would be doing that, and it's a story on CNBC that some people are taking out mortgages to buy Bitcoin. Uh, an SEC regulator said that this is the case of what's happening. And, you know, people are charging up their credit cards, they're taking out, you know, equity to borrow to buy Bitcoin. And whether or not that turns out to be a good move for people, you know, remains to be seen because we can't see the future. But boy, that sure does feel risky to me. Well, you know what? There's been this is not the first time this has happened. Now CNBC now is talking about it now, but I mean, I saw Reddit post back in June when people were talking about, you know, getting a mortgage on their home and taking all of that and buying it on Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin with it. And if you had done that in June, that, that was genius. <laughs> right. Right? I mean, I mean they did that and they made a ridiculous amount of money when Bitcoin was like, you know, $1500 and they put, you know, $300,000 into it and mortgaged their home out. Uh, and that worked out really well for that guy. Now, when we're talking about Bitcoin being, you know, fifteen, eighteen thousand dollars, and maybe going up to a hundred thousand down the road, hundred fifty thousand, uh, it's still risky. And if you are, you know, leveraging the future uh, of your family, and that's probably not a good idea. As we've always said, don't wager more than you can afford to lose. And if you are leveraging your future in that way, and things go things go down, like like what happens if you know, the the uh, the SEC or somebody puts some regulations down on Bitcoin and all of a sudden it becomes illegal to use in America and the price just tanks and you can't get out of it quick enough. Right. So who knows what's going to happen? You got to be smart about it. Just like the CEO of Coinbase said, uh, invest responsibly mortgaging your home. 
Probably not a good idea. Probably not the best idea. Finally, in the file under the what kind of shenanigans are these department uh, on CryptoVest.com, a story Starbucks store caught mining Monero on customers' laptops using Wi-Fi. This is a Starbucks store in Argentina uh, that was running a script by Coin Hive, which actually our uh, our friend uh, Hot Lou uh, told us about. And then the story popped up, and, and and I was like, oh well, we should probably talk about this. The guy tweeted, "Hi at Starbucks at Starbucks R." That's Argentina. Did you know that your in-store Wi-Fi provider in Buenos Aires forces a 10-second delay when you first connect to the Wi-Fi so it can mine Bitcoin using a customer's laptop? Feels a little off-brand. And he put a screenshot of the source code with uh, the CoinHive code in it to to point it out. So um, they're trying to uh, do more than caffeinate people at this particular Starbucks there in Argentina. That's true. And CoinHive, CoinHive actually mines Monero, not Bitcoin. But, you know, for somebody to go through and do a screenshot of the traffic, that was pretty high speed. And you know what? I, I think if and it's most likely it wasn't Starbucks who did it. It was somebody at the that particular Starbucks who most likely had hooked that up and done that. We were having a conversation with Hot Lou about, you know, he said, hey, you should put CoinHive on the badcryptopodcast.com. Let everybody know that if they come to the site. And they could mine Monero and we could donate that Monero to charity or something. But um, we've not done that. Uh, it seems like if you do something like that, you need to let people know you can't just put it on there because then it's then it's unwanted malware that slows the process down. So not yeah, a big fan I, of that. I, I'm not a fan. I don't uh, I don't because people won't know until they get there. And what if, you know, one like malware bites or one of the other softwares picks up on this? Say the site is unsafe. Mm -hmm. I think that's a like Google action. says no go. And then we, and then we all lose. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's good. So um, yeah, um, there you are. Let's get to talking about net neutrality. Mr. Travis, right? There are fewer topics being discussed in the tech space right now that are more confusing <laughs> to all of us than this whole net neutrality thing. In fact, I still don't know exactly what I think, and I still don't know exactly what's true and what's fake news, because there is so much being said about this. What, what's, what's your understanding of what net neutrality is, Travis? Well, so the, the basic tenet, as we are meant to believe, is that um, you know you, you want to have the all traffic on the internet it should be neutral it should be all treated the same all content all all bytes and bits should be treated equal they should not create fast lanes or they should not do any speed throttling on any of the content that way joshmo.com can get as much traffic as google gets in theory or at least the same priority of that and they say that its removal would allow companies to decide which traffic to prioritize over time. And uh, so, you know what? So it, it's an interesting thing. And how does this apply and how does this impact cryptocurrency? And are they really throttling traffic? Is it really um, what it seems is, is as, as they're pitching it to us? It's hard to decipher from what's real, what the real things are we need to be concerned about and what's propaganda and what's PR, really. Well, you know, here's the first thing that I notice. Well, well, here's what we need to know. Uh, net neutrality was something that was, you know, brought into play um, the bill that was passed into law under the Obama administration, an administration known to be kind of regulation heavy. You know, what we're seeing right now with Trump is he's doing away with a lot of regulation because the belief is that less regulation leads to more free market principles taking place and competition so that the cream rises to, you know, the, the top. And those are more libertarian principles, not so much Republican, but but true libertarian principles. And so I'm not, I, I, again, just because it was, you know, brought into law under the Obama administration, Trump's wanting to do away with it doesn't mean that I've, you know, settled on my opinion on this. But I have noticed, Travis, that those that are trying to fight this, um, being repealed are the Googles, the Facebooks, the Twitters, you know, the big 
corporations that kind of own, you know, the the eyeballs on the internet. And that is something that makes me question it. That's, you know, immediately the the counterculture rebel in me goes, hmm, if the big money who are controlling what we see and how we engage and are tracking our every move are opposed to the repeal, then I'm wondering if we're not getting the whole story. Right. Well, that's that's a good thought there. So back in the day, you know, so whenever they originally put this in in 2015, you know, they decided to regulate Internet service providers as a common carrier through this this 1930s era law, the Title II of the Communications Act. And that was a law that was designed to manage government monopolies like the phone company. Right. And so it's, it's kind of an outdated law, not meant to govern 21st century networks potentially. But and you're exactly right. My spidey senses go off, too, when these big corporations, the ones who benefit the most, are the ones going, hey, hey, don't repeal this. Ajit Pai, the uh, current chairman of the FCC, he said last week that he's planning to undo that 2015 decision which would then set the internet instead to the old rules that had governed things for over 20 years and created all of this successful internet that we have today. That like there was no rule up until 2015. That's just the way that it was. So does this regulation change things? There was no rule before that said, Hey, everything is neutral and we must all have it this way. And so there are still some think tanks and these special interest groups that, uh, that think that there are reasons to keep net neutrality, net neutrality. If you talk to it with people, most people will just blindly say, yes, we need to have net neutrality without actually understanding the mechanics of the whole thing and, and, and why it's good. And I I tell you, I don't think I'm not an expert on this. And when it happened in 2015, I was like, yeah, we need net neutrality. And then if it's if, what we actually need is, yeah, we need internet freedom of press. We need to quit having Google and you know, Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and these social and YouTube, like monitoring content so heavily where they are oppressing certain people's points of view. That's a much bigger problem, in my opinion, Mr. Joel Com. I see a lot of FUD created and I see people being manipulated to believe something based on headlines. For example, I'm looking at motherboard.vice.com. Uh, Vice is a left-leaning publication. The headline is, the end of net neutrality means ISPs could crack down on cryptocurrencies. Experts worry that net neutrality repeals could affect everyone's favorite magical internet money. Hey, did they steal that from us? Uh, I'm not sure when we started using that, but I guess somebody said it before us. But it's you know, magic internet money, but we call it magical. If you sell it like that to people, well, the, how can you do that? No, don't take away our magical internet money. Don't right. The, it doesn't give you the whole story, and this is why I'm still undecided. I'm leaning towards skeptical about this being a bad thing, but I'm also, it's very easy to manipulate the masses by putting out a headline in a story that is intended to scare you. And who knows who's really behind that and what the real motive and intent is. Uh, SaveTheInternet.com says, net neutrality is the basic principles that prohibits internet service providers like AT&T, Comcast, and Verizon from speeding up, slowing down, or blocking any content applications or websites you want to use. It's the way the internet has always worked. The internet without net neutrality isn't really the internet. Hmm. Is that... And is that right? Is that an actual thing? So what happened between 1995 and 2015? I mean, there was no, you know, mandated regulation up until that point to say one way or the other. And then, you know, there was some problems and different, there was some different issues, but that was handled, right? I mean, there was a case uh, with, I recall, I'll call, I recall in 2007, Comcast throttling, you know, BitTorrent traffic, Right. Usability and, and, and uh, the traffic gets degraded. Your quality of the line gets degraded. Netflix, they were forced to pay Comcast a premium for faster services to customers. And then Verizon had done some stuff where it banned Google Wallet back in the day. And you know what? I mean, we're seeing these companies ban. All, I'm actually seeing more problems with the big Internet companies than I am the ISPs at this at this particular time, because 
I'm not seeing ISPs saying, wait, you can't go watch this video. YouTube saying that Facebook, they're saying you can't watch this. This is, this is content that you cannot go and see Mr. Joel Kahn because we've deemed that it's not the right uh, narrative for, for you to watch. And so we're not going to allow you to see it. We're not going to allow you to make money on advertising on this content either, because we don't agree with what you're saying. That's a bigger problem. I think so. Yeah. They're definitely demonetizing those that they disagree with. And by they, we mean the those in charge. And Silicon Valley has a has very um, specific political stripes that that are the ruling body. And you know what? They're um, they're public corporations, and they have to answer to uh, their shareholders. But it's up to them to decide what they're going to do. Right? They are their own company, and if they choose to turn people away, then so be it. But you know, you talk about Insidious. There's a story about Twitter which um, says that in the not too distant future, they're going to be tracking your cookies across other websites and deciding whether or not you're able to be on their platform or whether or not you're going to you know, get exposure based on other content that you're visiting. At least that's you know, how I understand from what I read. If that's fake news, somebody can, uh, can let me know that that's fake news. I've read news. that too. I, I have well, read that. Is, and- the bad yeah. crypto podcast and sometimes we get it wrong mm-hmm. but it wouldn't surprise me that's that's completely a problem that's like oh we saw that you went to uh, breitbart and read an article and so we're going to make sure that most people don't see your tweets now right and we know that you believed it just because you read something it means you're falling hook line and sinker or you went to vox and mm-hmm. because you read it you somehow are, you know, being influenced. Did you know it's possible to go to news sites you disagree with and, and read content and uh, and not necessarily, you know, be influenced to the other side? Yeah, I do that all the time. That's how you go down a rabbit hole to discern, you know, what's real and what's not real. I mean, if basically what they're saying is we don't want you to do research onto things that we don't think you should be researching. Like I'll go down rabbit holes just because I want to know how things work. I mean, I've gone to all different types of sites and reading things because a lot of times you're going to find different information on some of these independent sites than you are with these mainstream media sites because they have narratives that they want to to be and agendas that they have to, you know, relay to the people. They have they have strategies and they have mandates that they they got to. We got to talk about these things, right? Because guess what? Who owns those media companies? Well, those same companies and those same people who own those media companies. A lot of times they own these big corporations and those big corporate. A lot of times they're tied to the big global banking industries in some ways and they fund the politicians. It's just big. It's this big, huge monetary circle jerk that ends up happening. Oh, the money's created. Oh, the Federal Reserve Bank, the ones who run all that. Oh, guess what? Now they have all this money over time and now they buy the corporations. They they buy the politicians. They pay for the media companies and then they set the narratives and then they keep moving on. That's why we see there's such a problem today in in um, a lot of what's going on in Congress and with, with, with the government in general. There's a lot of corruption going on because all this money fuels corruption. And that's why I think crypto in a lot of ways is, is, is taking that away. And, um, you know what, this, this net neutrality thing is going to continue to develop. And, uh, the big news is going to happen. I guess it's going to happen on the 14th of December is when they're going to be, uh, going over and discussing net neutrality regulation and potentially repealing it all. I just want to read one bit out of this dissenting piece that's published in Chicago Tribune. Basically what it says is that the fear is that internet providers, basically your cable companies and the wireless characters, are going to take control of the bandwidth for their own benefit. They're going to speed up and improve uh, transmission quality of sites they control and charge more for high speeds while slowing down everything else. So basically, you know, pay or it's it's going to slow down. The you know by this thinking it says the actual piping, which is your bandwidth, is akin to a regulated water or electric company and should be maintained as neutral. Uh, but the the writer goes on to say that would make sense if we believe we've reached a point of maximum progress and our main concern, as with an electric utility, is keeping the lights on. This is a really good point. He says that doesn't strike us as anything near the reality. Digital technology is still a new evolving industry, more like robotics or bit coins hmm, than water service. Think about driverless vehicles, wearable health monitors, and other internet-abled innovations coming to fruition. The emphasis needs to be on encouraging scientific discovery and commercial discovery while incorporating safeguards against exploitation. 
And, you know, I just, I still lean towards let's find free market solutions to this rather than heavy handed government regulation that is bought and paid for by corporations. That's, Mm -hmm. I'm leaning that way. I'm not all in, but I'm leaning. Well, my, my lean would be this. Look, we're two years away from 5G technology starting to be rolled out worldwide. 2020 is when 5G is going to be rolling out. We're going to have a 30 gigabit connection to our phones, to our computers, to our uh, autonomous driving cars, right? Our refrigerator, our toothbrush. Speeds are not going to matter. Better, faster, cheaper internet. That's the, pro- that's the problem people are wanting. Better, faster. Che- Guess what? It's coming within two years, right? You're, we're going to have it. So for us to say, oh, look, Netflix needs to go faster. This needs to go faster. In a couple of years, it's going to be a moot point anyway, because everything is going to be way faster than we would ever possibly need. It's a moot point. It's like a cow's moot. opinion. Moot. It doesn't matter. Not moot. Meow. Oh, and Travis, I just remembered, you know, we said at the beginning we were going to talk about Litecoin and Ethereum go to the moon. Well, Litecoin hit like something like $380 and Ethereum hit like $730. So there you go. To the moon. Ladies and gentlemen of Bad Cryptopia, stay bad. Who's bad? The Bad Crypto Podcast is a production of Bad Crypto LLC. The content of the show, the videos, and the website is provided for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. It's not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice of any kind. You shouldn't make any decisions as to finances, investing, trading, or anything else based on this information without undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional financial advisor. Please understand that the trading of Bitcoin's and alternative cryptocurrencies have potential risks involved. Anyone wishing to invest in any of the currencies or tokens mentioned on this podcast should first seek their own independent professional financial advisor. Well, come on, let's do another one. Well, come on, we got to record another show.